Welcome to Sure Foundation Lutheran Church's podcast channel. The following sermon was preached on June 16th, 2024, on the basis of Mark chapter 4, verses 26 to 34. Our gospel reading, also our sermon text today from Mark chapter 4. Jesus also said this, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground. Night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts a sickle to it, because the harvest has come. Again, he said, What shall we say the kingdom of God is like, or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them, as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them except without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. This is God's word. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, have you heard of a a term called helicopter parenting before? You know what a helicopter does, right? It, It hovers, it hovers over the ground. And so a helicopter parent, uh, people started calling parents this because they they hovered over everything that their children were doing. They they felt like they needed to oversee every aspect of their their child's life. Now, now perhaps there's a time when that's probably necessary, right? When you're trying to keep your child alive and you don't want them to stick their fingers into electrical sockets and and, and any good stuff like like that, right? But, But at a certain point... That, that kind of overbearing nature can, can tend to be detrimental to a child, to their development, to their ability to mature and make their own decisions and, and make their own mistakes even too, right, and learn from those things. It, it reminds me a little bit, when you, when you think of that, that term, it reminds me a little bit of, of Paul, the Apostle Paul, at the end of the book of Ephesians, has a specific instruction for fathers. He says, fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Exasperate, not a word we use all that often, but it means to irritate greatly or to provoke to a high degree. And so the encouragement there is not to to clamp down with more rules and laws and regulations and all these different things that you might put in the the household, but it's to to train up in the instruction of the Lord, to to let go and to trust that that what, what you have given will bear fruit. That term, helicopter parenting, it, it actually shows up in a, a book in the 60s. It, it, it started getting used a little bit in the 80s, uh, but, but it was really teachers in, in the 90s and early 2000s when millennials started going to, to grade school, they started coming up with that, or teachers started coming up with the, the term helicopter parenting because the parents of millennials were helicopter parents. They were trying to oversee everything and, and be involved in every aspect of their, their child's life to, in an overbearing sort of way. Well, there's a new term out uh, with, with, with parents of kids today. Maybe you've heard of this one. Uh, snowplow parenting or bulldozer parenting or lawnmower. I've heard, I've heard all of those, right? Um, and the idea of, of this one is a little different, a little different than the helicopter parents. We've got all kinds of vehicles here today, right? Uh, but a snowplow parent was, was somebody who wanted to go in front of their child and, and remove any obstacle that might cause their child any sort of discomfort or, or pain or might challenge them in some way or, or might lead to some disappointment. They wanted to remove all of those things so that their child would never have to experience any of that. Now, now, I promise it's, this is not a parenting seminar. I am driving at a point here. Uh, but I think these two things have, these two styles of parenting, or par- I maybe wouldn't even call them styles. They're just a, a style of parenting that parents find themselves falling into. But they have something in common, right? A desire for control, right? This, this 
desire to control different aspects of their children's life and really to, to control the results uh, of their, their, their training. And it, it reveals, that desire for control kind of reveals something uh, about what they think about their, their child, what they think about how they have parented that child, right? They don't trust that what they've given their child is going to bear fruit. They don't trust that, that their child is going to be able to handle adversity, so they have to snowplow it away before their child gets to that. They don't trust that, that they're going to be ha- able to handle disappointment, so they have to, to get rid of it before that. They don't trust that their child is going to be able to make good decisions, so they're, they're helicoptering over. They need to be involved and have their hands in, in everything. They don't trust that what they have given them will, will bear fruit. And, and I'm not ragging on parents because it's tough. It's really tough because a lot of times you don't see the results that you think you're going to see, right? You've done your best to train that, that child up in the, in the training and instruction of the Lord, right? You, you've been, done your best to give them something that's valuable, how to, how to change their oil or how to fold their laundry or any of these things, but their room's still messy and their oil goes unchanged. They don't, you don't see the intended result of what you've, you've taught, and so you, you grab for control. You want that control because you, you want to see the fruit in the way that you expect to see the fruit. And, and whereas you can see physical growth, that's a pretty easy thing to see. It's hard to see growth in character. It's hard to see growth in maturity. That's all stuff that happens below the surface. Right? There's a connection that we can make to the, the parables that Jesus speaks about today. In the first one, he, he's describing what the kingdom of God is like. And he says it's like a man who's scattering seed. Right? And this man scatters the seed, but then he kind of just goes about his life. Right? He says he, he goes to sleep, he wakes up, and, and apart from his attention to the seed, the seed buds and sprouts. Right? It forms the stalk, it forms the head, it forms the kernel, right? And then when it's fully grown... It's harvested. That, that fruit is, is taken in. And what he's trying to describe is how the gospel works. When, when the gospel is planted in someone's heart, through the work of the, the Holy Spirit, working through the word and the, the sacraments, that faith that is given is powerful. And it's effective. And Jesus has promised that. You know, whereas uh, we, we might teach someone how to teach our child how to change the oil or fold the laundry, we don't have a promise that they're going to keep doing that when they, when they grow up, right? But, but God has given us a promise about the gospel and how powerful and effective it is and that it will grow and it will produce fruit because that's how powerful it is. You maybe heard, heard this quote, uh, this is a, a Martin Luther quote, but really awesome quote to talk about this. You, you know, Martin Luther, he, he did a lot of things, right? He wrote extensively, but, but in this quote that he, he, he has, he says, essentially, he did nothing. But the word, because it's powerful, because it's effective, because it works on people's hearts, because it strengthens faith and, and grows, the word did everything. He says this, I simply taught, preached, and wrote God's word. Otherwise, I did nothing. And while I slept or drank Wittenberg beer with my friends Philip and Amsdorf, the word so greatly weakened the papacy that no prince or emperor ever inflicted such losses upon it. I did nothing. The word did everything. We got a little bit of Luther color in there too, right? The word is powerful and effective as is the Holy Spirit. He is powerful and effective. He, He produces fruit and growth within a heart. And that's what, what faith does. It, it grows, right? But that growth, it might happen on a different timeline than you or I would come to expect, right? And that fruit that is produced might come in a different way than, than we might expect it. And we can have some problems with that sometimes. In fact, when the, the growth doesn't seem to be happening in the way that we'd expect to happen, in the timeline in which we expect. When the fruit's not being produced in the way that we think it's going to be produced or how we want it to be 
produced, we can become rather impatient. And that impatience can, can kind of lead us to doubt the power and the effectiveness of God's Word. Is it really working? You know, should we still keep attending to, to the Word of God? And when we doubt the power and effectiveness of, the God, of God's Word, sometimes we think we, we need to add our own stuff too, right? But we need to add some things that are going to produce the results that I want here and now, Right? Or maybe something else happens, right? When, when we get impatient, when we doubt the, the power and effectiveness of the Word of God, maybe it starts to become maybe a little less important. It, it's not producing the results that we want or what we think is going to happen, so we kind of deprioritize the hearing of the Word a bit for, for things that maybe do produce results here and not what, what we can see with our, our own eyes. <laughs> what arrogance we have, Right? To think that, that somehow we could make, we could come up with a better product than what the Word of God is. That, that we could find something that's more powerful than the Holy Spirit. But how incredibly loving is our God that He is, he is patient with us. That, that when we're so prone to stray in those ways, He comes to us and He reminds us again of the, the power of His Word. And the, the power of the Holy Spirit working in that Word. The faith that he has given you through the word, through through baptism, the faith that he has worked in your heart is more powerful than we have the ability to perceive. Now, now just think about this for a second. Uh, An unbeliever and a believer can look remarkably similar, right? And their lives can look remarkably similar too. But the Bible says that, that when someone goes from being an unbeliever To a believer, it says they have crossed over from death to life. They were dead. They were the walking dead. And now they are alive in Christ. That's just about as dramatic a change as you could ever have. And yet it's imperceptible to us. We can't see it with our eyes. But but God tells us through his word that that's what happened. When you went from unbelieving to believing... You crossed over from death to life. You've been made alive, and those who are alive, he promises. He promises us. Through the power of the Word and the Holy Spirit, you will grow, and you will produce fruit. But but maybe not in the ways that we would dictate, right? The the fruit doesn't come in the ways that we we maybe want them to or, or expect them to. Right? When we're talking about fruits, we're talking about uh, the, the fruits of faith, good works, things that we, we can see. And so when someone comes to believe in Jesus as their Savior, um, when, when you're training up your child in the Lord, um, you might expect those fruits to show up in certain ways. And sometimes they don't. We don't get to dictate that. But he promises us that it will bear fruit, that this faith, faith will bear fruit in this life, even if we can't perceive that. And ultimately, the fruit that will be produced is the fruit unto eternal life, right? That's what, that's what he said at the end of the parable. He says, as soon as the grain is ripe, he puts a sickle to it because the harvest has come. In, in this case, the, the sickle, the harvest, this is a happy thing. This is when we get to go to heaven to, to be with Jesus. That's the culmination of faith. That's where it all, all ends. And so when, when our time has come, when, when the Lord comes to harvest us, in a way, uh, the fruit of our faith will be heaven. We get to be with Jesus forever, where our hope truly lies. So, therefore, in, in our life, then, it's not our job to try to make God's Word more effective, as if we could possibly do that, right? It's not our job to try to make the Holy Spirit more powerful. We can't do that either, right? It's our job to... to preach the word, teach the word, hear the word, believe the word, and trust that God is going to make that faith grow and that God will lead us to the culmination of our faith, which is in heaven. The second parable, he, he talks about the, this mustard seed. And he mentions that the mustard seed is the smallest of all the seeds, right? But, but he talks about the, the great potential that that seed has within it. That as it grows, it's expansive, right? It's the smallest of the seeds, but 
but it grows to, to a point where birds can nest under it, and it, it benefits the, the, the environment around it. The same is true with our faith, right? It, it might seem small. It might seem insignificant, but what God has started within you can grow. It can be expansive. In fact, it can be a blessing to others. Just like that, that plant can be a blessing to the, the birds, so also your faith is a blessing to those around you. Because as you produce fruit, those fruits of good works, th- those benefit your neighbor, right? God doesn't need your good works. He, do- he doesn't need them. He is completely self-sufficient on his own. He doesn't need them from you, but guess who needs your works? Your neighbor needs your works. And, and so as that faith grows in you, as, as that faith produces fruit in you, guess who benefits? Your neighbor, your neighbor. And this is how God takes care of of each other. And you you are blessed by other people's works as well. And so what we can do is we can trust the faith that God has given to us. We can trust the faith that has been implanted in the the people around us, people that we love in our, our, our life. And we can trust that that will grow and that will produce fruit because God has promised as such. And so we just attend to the, the training and instruction of the Lord. We attend to hearing the word, and we make every effort to come and hear it often. We make every effort to, to, to spend that time in God's word so that we may grow and so that the Holy Spirit may grow our faith. And so, in the end, what you got is, is freedom. It's freedom to just trust. Trust that what God has promised is true. Trust that because God has given you the gift of faith through the power of the Holy Spirit, you can trust that you will grow. Trust that, that when you bring your child up in the training and instruction of the Lord, what has been given to them, even if it doesn't seem like it's producing fruit in the ways that you think it's going to, it's powerful, it's effective, and that Holy Spirit still continues to, to work. As a church, it frees us up. We just get to attend to the teaching and preaching of God's word, to hearing it off and to encouraging one another, and we trust the results we trust the results to, to God, that, that his word will not return to him empty. He makes us that, that promise. And so for us, guess what? There, there's no need for helicoptering. There's no need for snow plowing. We just get to trust the Lord. Amen. Hey, Pastor Wilkie here. Thanks for listening to this week's sermon. If you were built up by this and grew in your faith, could you do us a favor and hit subscribe wherever you're listening to this? It does two things. It makes sure that you never miss any content from Sure Foundation, but it also helps us be seen by more people more often so that more people will hear about Jesus. We hope you come back again next week to hear another sermon. God bless.